So at this point, if you're able to see something like what mine is, you've got these input fields uh, that will load up in your project. It won't work yet to try to save anything. Clear should work. That's an easy one. But uh, save will kind of refresh the app. Well, that's similar to what happened when we were creating an account in that we had to remove the default behavior. Because a form, as we said, as we said before, a form is running on a traditionally on a web page on a server. Well, what would happen is that it would reset or refresh on the server to show the result. We don't want the default behavior of resetting anymore, so we'll need to set up an event listener and then to handle the default behavior and then <coughs> collect the data. So, if you've got it working like this, let's now open the uh, index.js file. In your scripts folder, let's open index.js. Okay, so we need to we need to pay attention to the event of the of the comic book data being saved. So in the uh, index.js file, let's go to the end of our code where we've got our block of uh, event listeners. We're going to listen for an event of submitting that form. So far, we've got when the sign-up form is submitted, when the login form is submitted, or when generically a button is clicked, log out. So we're going to do something very similar to line 227. So we can note here, uh, event listener for submitting the save comic form. We'll notice the syntax of what we've got up over on line 227 and 228. We've got some object when we submit run a function. We haven't made objects, or we haven't made an object out of that form. So we, uh, before we do the event listener, we need an object, just like we have the examples here, L form sign up. Well, that is what we've got near the beginning of the document over on line 31. Early on in the beginning, we created an object representing the form to sign up or to log in. We'll do the same thing for the for the save comic. Um, so we'll just put it here at the end, just sequentially, line 47 or so. Create a variable, call it dollar $l uh, form save comic, and that's equal to the jQuery selector. We're going to find an element with a certain ID, so pound, the name of our form. What is the ID of the form for save comic? Form save comic. We were very creative, right? So that's the, that's the ID of, of our particular form. In the HTML, we are then creating a JavaScript object for it here. Then we can return back down to our event listeners to create a listener to listen for clicking the submit button. So go ahead and type that. Then we'll then we'll back down to the listeners.
Okay, so back to the bottom. What we were about to type was then uh, the name of that object we just created, $L form save comic dot submit parentheses so we've got an object and it's and the and the uh, method that we're using there is submit once the submit button is pressed of that particular object we run a function to input the data same syntax as before then so function an anonymous function parentheses space curly braces semicolon there or actually not there in here uh, fn save comic parentheses there curly brace there so yeah two curly braces there because that that curly brace is regard the final curly brace at the end is regarding the main uh, command of the dot submit in between the uh, parentheses we've got then a function an anonymous function where we can capture the event the default event of refreshing the screen the whole point of doing this is we want to stop the screen refresh. Right when you try to save the comic right now, the screen refreshes. We don't want that. We want to do other things because we're not running this form off of a server in the traditional way. So we'll need to define that. We'll need to define that function that <clears throat> I'm making a reference to. So fn save comic will back up to where we've got our function definitions. I have I see a note there on line 218. That's where we ended our last function, the function logout. So we'll set up here define function save comic to save a comic. So function the name of the function in question. It's the end of save comic. We're passing in the event, the submit event, the default event, the refresh everything event. Whenever we create any of these functions, remember our common practice is to have a little console output that says this function is running so that at the very least we see in the console what's running, what I expect. I press the button, the function seems to be running, that eliminates a variable of possible problems. So console log saying fn save comic is running. But more importantly, event.prevent default. Now we've created forms before to capture data and then do something with it. Specifically, for example, when you create an account, we captured what was the person's email and password and then did something with it. We had also the form to log in, capture their, their email and password and process it, confirm that the user exists, etc. So this function is going to do a variety of things there. It's going to capture the data, process it, then start to save it into our database. 
Um, just to confirm that so far it works, go ahead and run this in your device or uh, simulator. Keep an, a, an eye out in the console to see those messages. This will not work yet, of course, but it should not refresh the whole screen because we've got event prevent default. Just confirm that there's no big refresh and confirm that you have some console output, this line 222. So again, uh, uh, I don't like that it, it doesn't clear my console between sessions. So usually what I do as soon as I run it in the simulator or device, I click the X there to clear my JavaScript console if I'm using the Visual Studio console. So that now everything I do subsequent to that will be the latest output. So you have to put something in these fields. And again, just for testing early on, you don't have to be that complex. I'm going to save comic A, number one, from 1999, whatever. You don't have to put real data just yet. It's going to be a waste of your time to put in real data as we're this early on in the project. I want to click Save. And it should not refresh, but I should see that my output here from console is running line 221. If that didn't work, we'll pause here, of course, to make sure that works, because if this doesn't work, further things won't work. So that was what we've got so far. Okay, so... Now we're going to work with 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 our database. Uh, question. Let's, let's save console. That message right there. Function save comic is running. So we're going to start to work with our with our database. Um, we saved some simple amount of data with local storage. But now that's too simple because we're going to save several fields per comic. And we introduced <clears throat> JSON, the concept of JSON, which is a way to bundle data together. So taking both of the concepts, sort of, of local storage plus JSON will give us the database where we're going to save our comics. Traditionally, a database for a website was running on a server. It was something like MySQL or Oracle or those sorts of things. It was a database that was installed on a server. We connected to the server. We interfaced with the database, retrieved data, stored data. We talked back and forth. Well, this app does not require a server. It's going to be self-contained the data is going to exist in the app itself. It can then also save the data to a server. But we're going to start off that the data is self-contained. And the database we're going to use then could be replicated to a server. The database we're going to use is one I've mentioned before called PouchDB. So let's take a little segue over to Let's go to your web browser and let's take a segue to pouchdb.com. Pouchdb.com, the database that syncs, synchronizes. Pouchdb is an open source JavaScript database inspired by Apache CouchDB that is designed to run well within the browser. PouchDB was created to help web developers build apps that run, that work as well offline as they do online. It enables apps to store data locally when offline, then sync it with CouchDB on a compatible server when the app is back online, keeping the user's data in sync no matter where they next log in. So uh, that's, that's very cool because, again, as I said, traditionally a database runs on a server. So if this device doesn't have an internet connection, it cannot access the server and load the data. This modern crop of types of databases uh, exist nowadays that can run like in the device and then also save the data to the cloud in a server. We'll focus on the local storage version of it first and then cover the connection to the server later. 
but it's based in JavaScript and it's open source. So you don't need a license for it. You can start using it right away. You don't have to pay a licensing fee, whatever. It's completely free to use for any kind of project. It's based in JavaScript. And here's a little bit of JavaScript code. VAR DB equals new pouch DB quotes DB name. Well, this is familiar. Creating a variable called whatever database. Creating a new instance of the object pouch DB with a specific name of DB name. So this is sort of like local storage set item. Local storage set item saved one entry into the internal storage of the browser. This is creating a database with uh, hundreds more times space than local storage. Basically, as much space as on the person's device. Local storage saves up to like one megabyte of data, but PouchDB can save basically up to the amount of data uh, or storage on the device. And so it's going to create an internal database DB name. We'll have a command db.put, just like we've had um, l button form dot submit or my button dot on click. We're going to continue to have some sort of object, some sort of dot method, and all of the possible methods of PouchDB are on this site in the in the documentation of how it works. We're not going to use every pouch command. We're going to use the big ones, such as put data into the database. And so, for instance, we're putting a, hey, that looks like JSON data. There's the curly braces. Um, there's the name of the field, colon, data, comma. Another name of a field, colon, data comma another field colon data final piece of data no final comma now it is slightly different than JSON in that well why doesn't why isn't name in quotes why isn't age in quotes I'll get to that a little later and then that number why isn't the number in quotes I'll get to that also but we're putting data into a pouch database in JSON format that was the point of having the lecture last time and me reiterating it a little bit earlier. We will have other commands. DB changes on change. That's an event listener. We had over here, just to compare, we had on click when a person wanted to log out. On that object, on the event of a click, log us out. Pouch has its own sorts of on event listeners. One of them is change. And again, they're all listed, the possibilities here in the guides and in learning. But on the event of a change into our database, very simply here, report in the console that changes happened. Other things that could happen would be like update the screen to show something new or a message or maybe um, retrieve or play a sound so once there's a change to our database do something and then we've got db.replicate2 we've got the to method um, attached to our db object let's replicate let's copy all of the data that's on the device to a server that requires the server to be set up and configured and all of that and we'll talk about that later but we'll be covering saving it just to the device so that's some quick syntax for it here you can read uh, here again everything else about how does it work and latest changes and, and all of that but Let's go over then to, let's see what's the easiest one. Let's go to, uh, yeah, let's look at guides. At the top, click guides. There's an intro here. You can read that on your own. What is it? Uh, basically, it's a modern type of a database that they call the NoSQL style database. 
traditional types of databases again ran on a server and had certain requirements and all of that this is just running right off of your own device on the left side jumping over to setting up pouch DB we can either connect to the file online or download it as part of our project we'll be downloading it in a moment but we need then a script tag connecting to a JavaScript file. PouchDB works because it's another JavaScript library. It's another file full of JavaScript commands that we can use. db.put or db.get or db.delete, all of those things make sense when we have a connection to the Pouch <coughs> JavaScript file. Besides that, you don't have to worry about the rest. Working with databases. In the example here, to create a database, and we can create as many as we want, as much storage is on the device. We create a variable for a database object, can be named anything. They're going to use over and over DB for database. We create a new instance of the pouch object with some sort of internal name. Here they're calling their database internally kittens. So this is a database that's going to store kittens or any data. If we want to connect to it on a server, well, it's very, very similar, but it needs a full server path on the right port and setup and all of that. We have documents. What's a document? Doc PouchDB is a NoSQL database, meaning that you store unstructured documents rather than explicitly specified, specifying a schema with rows, tables, and all that. A document might look like this. Again, that should look familiar. That's JSON data. There's a field ID. There's a field name, a field occupation, <coughs> a field of age. Something more complex here, hobbies. More than one hobby, more than one piece of data is associated with one field. But all of that is bundled together with the curly braces. And it has the quotes, colon, quotes, comma, over and over until the final one. And here it's text data, in quotes, one numeric data, not in quotes. There is also an array here, a list of other data. We'll talk about that later. And if we wanted to then attach a picture of one of these kittens, we would have, you know, a field, we would have comma, quotes, image, colon, and then a path to the picture, either in my WW folder, on another server, somewhere. But it's very easy then to create these fields, add to them, retrieve them, change them. If you come from an, from an SQL background, this handy conversion chart may help. So if you've had experience in the other kinds of databases, you might have heard of the concept of a table. There really aren't tables in Pouch. Um, it's sort of when you do the, the, you saw var equals new Pouch, it's sort of that. You've got rows in a SQL database. Well, it's a document. This would be a row in a classic database. Columns in a database is a field in Pouch. Well, this is a field here, a field of ID, a field of name, occupation. Uh, there's a primary key in that type of database. We've got a primary key as well, underscore ID, and index versus view. Here's another example of, of then the data. This one, however, is uh, bundled into a variable. So all of this data is defined, stored in a variable. What you may notice here, and it's very important, every entry into PouchDB requires a unique underscore ID. It's not really like the IDs we've worked with before, where there were IDs in classes and such. It's got to be underscore ID. Uh, technically, I don't believe it needs to be the first item, but it might as well be. But every record in the database is going to need an underscore ID and some sort of unique 
identifier here. No other record in this database can be called mittens. It would have to be mittens2 or mittens-a. Only one thing in the database can have that unique ID. So in our comics, for example, underscore ID Batman, number 1, year 1939. So we're going to save our data in JSON format into PouchDB. Because um, then we've got, oh, then we've got right here. Uh, all of the data got bundled into one object. So all of those separate fields are put into one object temporarily. So imagine we're, we're capturing all of that from the input form, bundling it as one object, doc. Then we do db.put doc. And that puts it into the database. It stores it with this unique identifier plus other metadata that we'll talk about. And that's it. We put a data, we put data into the database. We can get a a record, a document from the database. So we're saying here, from the database, let's get something with a unique identifier, underscore ID of mittens, and then display it in the console. So because there's one, in the example, there's one thing with the ID of mittens, this is saying that. Let's get the one entry in our database with an underscore ID of mittens. And then the console log will just spit back the spit spit back the data that we know that we put, plus other metadata such as a revision number. This database will be able to keep track of revision numbers. This is version one of the data, one dash whatever. As we then update the data, well, that kitten's not going to be three years forever. It's going to be four years old next year. So we need to update the data and resave it age equals 4, and this will say underscore rev revision 2 dash something. So it can keep track of changes to the data. And it'll go on to explain that a little bit more, how to do updates on the data. We'll, we'll do that ourselves. Of course, there's the example. They updated the data, it's 4 years old, and now it's got rev 2 dash something. This is what keeps track of conflicts, is that the current data, or is it the old data? We compare the different changes in the data. Looking at updating and deleting, we're going to have a way also to we're going to have a way to delete data. Right here we'll have db.remove. We're going to remove one entry to the database. We're going to remove one, you know, one user, one thing, one comic from the database. We'll have the operation to delete the whole database too in here somewhere. So this website here has all the documentation on how PouchDB completely works. We're not going to go through it page by page. We're, we're actually going to start using it. But we need to download the PouchDB file, add it to our project. Then we can start to write the code to start using PouchDB. We'll get specific in a moment. But general questions on PouchDB or the concept here? OK, so to use it, let's click on the top over here download version 7. It's going to say here, okay, you've got two files to download. Which one should we download? The compressed version. The uncompressed would be if we wanted to open that file and read what was in it. 
similar to jQuery Mobile, we never really need to do that, or jQuery. We don't need to open and view those files, we just need to know how to use them. So we want the compressed version, the one that is efficiently compressed so that our project is fast. So uh, depending on your browser, I think if you click on it, will it automatically save? Some browsers, if you click, it'll show you the code. You might have to right click to save. I'm in, uh, what am I? I'm in Firefox. So when I clicked on pouch uh, min.js, it pops up. Would you like to save it or cancel it? Yes, you want to save it. In my case, this got saved to the desktop, I guess. We need to uh, then move that file into your uh, Visual Studio project into the scripts folder. So once you download the JS file, pouchdb700 min.js, move it or copy it into your scripts folder in Visual Studio. Question. Why, why was the other files needed to be decompressed? Why the inconsistency? The jQuery mobile, for example, needed to be uncompressed because it included also a bunch of images and stuff. It had CSS, JavaScript, images, and all of that, so it was bundled together. This is just one file. It doesn't have extra images or any CSS. It's just JavaScript. So in Visual Studio, I see that I've got pouch in my project, but then I need to connect my index HTML file to that JavaScript library so I can start to use the commands of db.put, db.ket, db.remove. So let's move over to index HTML. Go to the end of your code. We've got at the end we've got let's connect to jQuery, then let's connect to jQuery mobile, then let's connect to Cordova, platform overrides, custom code. Uh, we're gonna add this before our custom code. We're gonna add this uh, before the platform overrides. In my case, line two hundred. 58. We're going to add a script where its source is that file. So script, you can put the type if you want or not. Again, I said previously that type of text JavaScript is assumed when you've got an HTML5 document, which we do. So I won't add the type just to save myself a little uh, typing, but I'll add a source. And remember, you can um, have, you know, the pop-up right here, so you don't have to type it wrong. Inside of scripts tab, you'll see pouchdb tab. It'll should type it for you. <clears throat> you can note that. Connect to the pouchdb um, JavaScript library. to be able to store complex data. Okay, so once we've got this, uh, this line in the HTML file, I'm going to save that. We've got a connection over to the pouch JavaScript library. We can start to write JavaScript commands in our JavaScript file about creating databases, adding, deleting, etc. We'll do something very basic first. 
So jump back to the index.js file. In our save comic function, quick note here, our first PouchDB database. So I would recommend, if you haven't done so on your own, you visit pouchdb.com. And read around a little bit in their documentation just to get familiar with it, because like most code, you don't have to have all <clears throat> the commands memorized. You know, in JavaScript, jQuery, or whatever, I don't have them all memorized. I can look them up as necessary, however. Same thing with PouchDB. I don't have every command of Pouch memorized. And there's not that many. There's like 12. But I don't need to do every single Pouch command. Uh, I, need to do, I need to know the ones that I need to accomplish my task. But on your own, you might want to look through the Pouch website. So one of the first things we'll do here, just for testing, we'll do var test db equal to new space pouch capital P DB capital DB parentheses semicolon in quotes is the internal name. It could be the same thing there as test db. They're both named the same thing, but the difference here is, okay, test db here is what we're going to use as we save a comic or retrieve a comic. And this test db over here is what we would see when we actually inspect the raw data in the database. So just to kind of make it obvious, let's say internal name db. We never really reference that anywhere in the JavaScript except here when we create the database. We reference the database in the JavaScript always, almost always, by that name right there. So on the left side, object name, JavaScript. On the right side, internal name. Almost never refer to internal name in JS. You view the data in the internal name in the debugger, which we'll see in a moment. So the idea here is we're going to run the project in a moment. We're going to fill in some stuff in the, in the input fields. We're going to click Submit. All that it's going to do is, if it doesn't exist yet, it will create a database called internal name DB. We're not saving the data to the database yet. We saw in the documentation that is db.put, or in our case, test db.put. We haven't done that yet. We won't do that yet. I want to see at the very least here that we are confirming that we downloaded the right file, we connected the JavaScript library, we, we created the database internally correctly. The spelling matters, of course, capital P, capital DB. I'm going to run this um, in the 
actually before I run it, have you been doing this? Have you been going to view error list? Have you been looking in your error list just in case before you run it, uh, before any problems happen? Remember the Cordova message is going to be normal, that's going to happen all the time, so you can ignore it. But if you uh, misspelled something else, uh, like here, whoops, I'm getting some errors here, comma expected, what's that about line 229? Oh, I misspelled new. So that error list here dynamically loads up any messages regarding errors. Yes? What was that under? What was the menu button? That was under view menu and then error list. Mm -hmm. So uh, save, save it at this point, load it in the simulator. We'll do the device in a moment, but it's a little faster to be in the simulator, the web browser in, in Chrome. So save it, run it in, or maybe probably actually do save all. If you've been working with more than one file, you may want to get used to doing save all. Run it in the simulator. As soon as the simulator starts, I'll press F12 to open the developer's console. If I go to save comic, just put whatever in those fields at the moment. The required ones at least. And then you hit save. So the screen should not refresh. The fields are still filled in. We'll deal with that later. It did not refresh. Great. The console should say that um, we were we were running the save comic function. No other feedback. Did we really save it to the database? Well, what I want to show you is from this debugger, from the console here, we can inspect the data being saved to PouchDB, similar to how we inspected the local storage data. Now, that was a long time ago. Can anyone remind me? Where do I go see the local storage data in Google Chrome? Application, yeah. So application, which may be hidden it may be hidden inside of the double arrows. Once you go to application, we were in local storage. Well, this is now going to start to save inside of something known as index.db. If you open index.db, I see here that there is a pouch database named the internal name that I typed here in uh, Visual Studio, internal name DB, it automatically prefixes it with underscore pouch, underscore, then the name of your database. There's a couple buttons here about refresh data and delete database. I would highly recommend that you don't click the delete database. That often causes problems in that the app is expecting the database, but you deleted it and it causes weird problems. We're going to write JavaScript code that will properly delete the database. It is safe, however, to refresh the database. Sometimes when you save data, it doesn't update on this screen right away. So if you refresh the database, that should be OK. But I don't recommend deleting the database here. When you open this little triangle, there's then a bunch of ways to view the data. The simplest one is by sequence. There's nothing saved here yet, but once we start to save data to the database, it will show here. The first comic you saved is here, and the value is here. Its name, its year, its note. When we save another comic, the second entry will be the second comic, so forth, by sequence. We can look at it in different ways as well here, but at the very least, I should see in Chrome that it did see that I've created a database with that name. Okay, we'll check that one moment. To test it, just to be 100% sure, I'm going to go back to my line right there and change it to say kitty. I'm going to create a brand new database 
when I click the button and the database will be called kitty. So change it to something else, save it, run it, and confirm another database got created.
Yeah, but it's from Yeah, you the um on device ready function. Nothing should be working. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
So um, up until this point, if you got this to work, this is at this point. Um, this is um, the most basic thing. Is uh, the most basic syntax here is that we're saving, we're creating a database. So when I click the button to save a comic, at the very least, what it does is it creates a database. And all I needed to do there was just to confirm it in the browser. We're going to be taking a peek at this data as we as we uh, continue to work because, as usual, we, we can't really just dive into the code. We kind of take it step by step to understand it. Just to confirm here, then, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, just, again, save something else. I'll save comic B, number two, whatever. So I want to just trigger that by clicking Save. It says save comic is running and then if I look at the application I should see a new database so I had a database of internal name DB and a database I just made right now called kitty so these names can be anything uppercase lowercase numbers whatever and each database can hold its own you know collection of like 500 megabytes of data in, a, in terms of databases 500 megabytes is a lot of data because a database is basically text yes a database has a picture in it in terms of it having a path to a picture, but not the actual picture data. So for us, we're not going to need to create multiple databases, but our database can store a lot of data for the comics we'll save, including the pictures. Uh, we'll do one more thing, then we'll take a break, which is that, okay, we created a database. We haven't stored any data to the database. Uh, so if you go back to your code, we're not going to get very complex or fancy yet about what they typed in yet. We're going to instead just do it in a very simple and raw way. We're going to say this, test db dot put. So all of these pouch commands are going to be, what's the name of the the database, not the internal name, but what's the name of it as referenced by the object, and then dot .put, dot .get, dot .remove, dot .update, whatever the commands are that we're trying to do to the database. So we're trying to put data. I'm going to put it in the plain raw JSON format, so curly braces. For readability, I'm going to break the curly braces apart into multiple lines. Just to, get, just to do it in the way that we got used to in the previous lectures regarding JSON. Quotes, underscore ID, space colon. Quotes, we'll say uh, comic one. Okay, so a couple of notes before I continue here. So we save data to pouch db in JSON format. So all that we've talked about, about what JSON format is, will still apply. A difference is that we need to have an underscore ID field. 
It can be the first item, the last item, the one in the middle, whatever. But we need to have an underscore ID. The difference is that we need to have an underscore ID field which differentiates, differentiates one document or entry from another. So only one thing in my database right now can be called comic1. If I try to save something else called comic1, it'll say there's a conflict that already exists. I may be trying to update comic1, that's allowed, and we'll talk about that later. But right now we are putting an entry into our database with a unique identifier of comic1, comma, quotes, title, colon, quotes, Batman, or whatever comic you want, comma. Again, obviously we're going to have this set up in that it's going to capture what the person typed. This is not doing that yet. This is going to be Batman number 12. So we can have, we can store string data, quotes, or number data, no quotes, other kinds of data like booleans and arrays and such, I'll cover that later. But that's why I didn't put a, I didn't put a, a quotes here, because this is, this is a number 12, not the word 12. Technically 12 number is different than the word 12. For example, I can add 12 plus 1 gives me 13 if they're numbers. But if it's the if it's the word twelve and I add the and I add the word one, I'm gonna get 121 because twelve plus one right next to each other becomes a new word one to one. So no quotes, uh, comma, and then we had year. Now I like putting the space here, but I think Visual Studio removes that extra space, so it doesn't really matter. And the year 19. 41 or something that's the final that's the final item in my data so no no further comma <clears throat> note no final comma in the data also note no comments in the data I want to write right here don't do it but I want to write no comments don't don't do that I mean uh, no comma you should you should not write comments in the JSON data in the curly braces you should not have JavaScript comments or HTML comments or any kind of comments it's just the data um, Technically, you could have a field called comment and right here, no final comma. Don't write this one. But if you wanted to have comments, it has to be JSON data. It cannot be JavaScript comments, HTML comments. So I, I won't have that. That's why I'm writing my comments way up here. You cannot, it's, it's not recommended to write your... your uh, comments within the string of data of the JSON object. So in a very, very simple way here, we are putting one entry into our database with a unique identifier with the three fields that we made up. <coughs> Underscore ID is required. It always has to be used. And then title, number, year, we made it up. I didn't put here comment or publisher. Uh, I'll do it a little later. But this is only going to store this entry, not what was typed into the input fields. Save it and run it to see this result. So I'm going to run it in the browser, F12. I'm going to switch back to the console view just to make sure everything looks good there. I'm going to save, just to be obvious here, I'm going to save the comic Iron Man, number one, 1964. And um, 
I'll click Save on this. I should not expect that data to be saved to the database yet. I'm not there yet. But what I should see, if I go to Application, I go then to Pouch Kitty, I open that up by sequence. I've got one entry in my database. And it's all of this data that I saved here. The number of the comic, the title of the comic, the year of the comic, and the ID plus revision. Comic 1, version 1 of the data. So you should see that. Not what you typed in there yet, but what you hard coded into the JavaScript. Right here, we've got put, open, close, parentheses, open, curly brace, close, curly brace. This one? Yeah. What does my comment say? It should be up here. When you've got the beginning of your function fn save comic, it should be opening right there. If it's, if it's missing, that'll cause big problems, yes, because there should be an opening curly brace there, because that one closes with that one there. If not, we'll check it in a moment. Uh, question here, Tanya? Oh, um, I, so maybe you could do this. I'll do the code in just a moment, yes. Uh, another question? There? No? Okay, so we'll do a break in just a moment, and I'll put my code in there in just a moment. But these are the big ideas that are happening here. We've got the uh, pouchdb JS file. We've got the JS file in our project. We've linked to it in the HTML. We started to create a database. And we started to put data into the database. After the break, we will set it up properly that it captures what the person typed into the boxes and puts it into the database and so forth. Then, of course, we'll cover editing what they typed. Whoops, I misspelled it. So we'll do that. Then we'll cover deleting the database. I no longer have that comic and that sort of thing. So if it worked this far, great. We can take a break. If not, I'll put a version of my code in the folder up to this point. Take a break until 845, and then we'll go on.